So thanks for the uh, introduction, Alyssa. I have to say, um, this is my first uh, lock, and I'm uh, delighted to be here. It's been a wonderful conference. Uh, as somebody who has put, put, uh, organized a couple of conferences myself, uh, it, it really takes a village. So uh, let's just thank the organizers uh, for doing such a terrific job. Um, um, so thank you again for inviting me. Um, I want to uh, just talk a little bit about this topic that's uh, been exciting to us for the last five years, that so we call it multimodal uh, classroom analytics. Um, so let me just start by uh, acknowledging our great research team um, at Notre Dame to the left and all our wonderful collaborators uh, to the right. Uh, this is really all their work, and it's just my privilege to present it to you. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, doing work in the classrooms uh, is expensive, and I really want to acknowledge our funders, uh, especially the NSF, who's been funding us uh, for quite some time. So, so thanks to the NSF. Um, so I'm going to split this up into about four topics. Uh, we'll just briefly talk about uh, what do I mean by multimodal classroom analytics, um, and look at some pioneering research in this area. And then we'll, we'll do two case studies. Um, this, is both, this is emerging research, one focused on student learning. Um, and then we'll completely shift over and talk a little bit about teacher learning. And then uh, we'll just end with a, with a couple of thoughts. Uh, we won't make this discussion too long because we'll have a follow up. And I want to keep time for your questions. So um, let me start by saying, what is multimodal classroom analytics? Um, and to kind of motivate this topic, um, I've been uh, being involved in doing more classroom research uh, over the last few years, um, being actually embedded in classrooms. And I want to say the classroom is a pretty wild place. Um, and let me just show you some examples. These are, these are obviously funny examples from YouTube. Um, so you may have great chemistry teachers doing amazing things like that. There are actual explosions. Of course, you have students zoning out. That's been me a few times. Uh, and you have the in infamous cell phone. <laughs> I totally went crazy. <laughs> and some truly bizarre behavior. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of great interesting things that occur in the classroom, um, and I want to tell you that um, uh, the classroom is surprisingly uh, an understudied learning context. So it is a so even in this day of digital learning um, and distance learning and and MOOCs and everything, um, for for a lot of students the core aspect of learning actually occurs in the classroom. This is mainly, this is primarily important for elementary and up to K-12. So the classroom is a fundamentally core context of learning. I, I don't think I need to uh, over-elaborate this point, but I will say it is a really under understudied aspect. The reason being, it's really difficult to do research in a classroom for anybody who's tried it. Most of what we know comes from about two sources, one, Humans doing observations in classrooms, taking detailed notes, sometimes doing video recording and hand coding them. There's been amazing work in this area, but obviously it's limited in scale and scope. And the other, from the student's perspective, most of the research comes from actually uh, experience sampling. So, so students have beepers and are paged. However, now with technology, I really feel we're at an unprecedented time to do, we have, we have these opportunities to do really amazing things in classrooms at scale, and this is why I'm so excited in this topic of multimodal classroom analytics. So let me just uh, say, well, I'm gonna ground this presentation in about two core questions. One, what can we learn about students and teachers by observing what they do, and I'll even go further to say what they do feel and think in real world classrooms. And two, putting our engineering hats on, how can we leverage insights from what we've learned to make learning and teaching more effective, engaging, enjoyable, and efficient. Um, so so I'm gonna, we're going to try to address those two questions. 
So let me begin by talking about some, what I think, in my, in my opinion, some really pioneering work on this idea of multimodal classroom analytics. Um, so one example comes to mind uh, almost 10 years ago. This is great work by um, Bev Wolf, uh, Ivana Arroyo, Wynne Borlson, and folks. Um, for many years, people have been doing work on sensing student emotions in the lab. But they said, let's go, let's go into the wild. Let's be really bold. And the resultant paper, it's called Emotion Sensors uh, Go to School. It's, it's sort of brilliant work. They actually fabricated, um, to do this at scale, this is, a, this is a pressure sensor. They made their own sensors. They used a pressure sensitive mouse. It's all do, do, do your, you know, made, made at home sensors at scale. Um, and they collected data from about, I think, 20 to 30 kids at a time. And the paper is a great testament of some of the challenges to experience. For example, kids break up the sensors because it's fun. They, 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 they mess around with things. Um, and it, and it's, 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 a, it's a good idea to see the challenges involved. I think, um, I think only about a fourth of the data could be actually used in a multimodal way. Uh, but, but that just inspires more innovation. Uh, perhaps my favorite example is, is, a, is a study uh, by, this, uh, by John Bidwell, and it's actually called Classroom Analytics. I think he coined the term. I just added multimodal to be different, um, and, and multimodal is important. Um, but he did this amazing thing. He, he had these um, cameras right there, and he was able to do, with basic computer vision, figure out where students are looking. But what was even cooler, he then had a camera in the back that was then used to project where they should be looking. So, so for example, in this case, you have the teacher moving around and you have the whiteboard, so he could define dynamic regions of interest and then intersect that with student gaze. I mean, how cool. Um, and you could have these great maps, and this is used to track student engagement. So, so I think this is a, this is a great, uh, great piece of work. Um, Turning on to the teacher, this is um, Kevin Miller's group um, at uh, Michigan. Uh, what they did was they focused on can we detect, this is in fourth grade um, classes, math classes, what teachers are doing. They want to promote more discussion. And so they actually had, can we detect whether students, whether teachers are doing discussion, lecture, or other things? Um, and they used this system uh, just from audio alone. Um, so they used a system called Lena. So what Lena is, Lena is this little voice recorder. It's actually designed for infant caregiver interactions. So, so it's really small, has a, has a good battery. You can, you can stick it in the pocket of the child. And then, then they, and they wear it for the, like they go for like two days, and you can it'll, it'll actually tell you infant speaking, mother speaking, and so on and so forth. So he actually used this simple device to be able to detect uh, whether the teacher is doing discussion and things like that. And the idea was to promote more discussion. Um, and this is a, lastly, I'll talk about a more recent paper. Uh, this is Pierre Dillenberg's group. Um, again, they mounted cameras so it, in in a classroom like this, and then they could first detect whole bodies um, from which you could actually figure out. Um, body movement. This is a great predictor of just basic, uh, basic arousal. Um, the other thing that they did, I think that was super cool, is they actually they, they, they did uh, face detection at scale, and then they could actually detect the orientation of attention. So uh, people, everybody's looking down or looking up as a way to get into uh, engagement. So, so there's been interesting work um, kind of in this area. So along these lines, I want to tell you about two, two pieces of work. Um, and let me just start by some of our work on uh, student learning. And I'm going to tell you about the curious case of, of mind wandering. Um, it's, it's sort of a fantastic phenomenon to study. Uh, we've been engaged in studying this for the last seven years. So um, I think we've all experienced reading something, watching a lecture, only to realize that, whoops, your mind has just gone a million miles away. You have no idea what happened. And, and then you, you're like, what happened? So it's actually a really common phenomenon. It's been estimated to occur as much as 50% of your thoughts in daily life, these are large-scale experience sampling studies, are believed to be off-task. Um, in the context of learning, uh, this is a meta-analysis of studies done in our own lab over the last five years. Uh, it's about 2,500 students. Uh, we find it occurs about 20 to 40% of the time during learning. And these estimates are pretty stable. So for example, during reading, it converges at about 30% of the time. While watching lectures, it's 40% of the time, mostly. Interactive films, about 20% of the time. Let me, just say a, let me just take a minute here to tell you about how mind wandering is tracked in these studies. So first, mind wandering means thinking about things other than the content. So if you're reading something and you're making an inference that's not, that goes beyond the text, that is not mind wandering. But if you're thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner today or tonight, that would be mind wandering. So the way this is done, are people are engaged in a learning session, and it's a deeply internal conscious phenomena. Sometimes you ask probes. So at key points, you give a probe. It could be an auditory probe, and then people respond yes or no or different ways. That's called probe-got mind-wandering. 
The other type is what we call self-caught mind wandering. This is the more naturalistic thing. People are just reading uninterrupted, and when they catch themselves mind wandering, they hit a key. So, so this, this is mainly probe caught, but there's also some self-caught, and you can notice it's, it's pretty prominent. So um, we have, um, we've been working towards a theoretical model that will ground some of our work of why does the mind wander during learning? Um, and it goes something like this. So um, at the core, uh, at the core piece here, you have this competition between goal-relevant thoughts and goal-irrelevant thoughts. Let's, what is a goal? Here we're defining the goal as the learning goal. The goal is to comprehend the material. So you can think about cognitive opera operations dealing with reading this text, for example. Goal-irrelevant thoughts are anything else. Now, they could be very relevant to the individual. My plan for dinner could be very important to me, but in this, in this definition, it's an irrelevant thought for the goal of comprehension. So these thoughts are totally competing. Uh, mind wandering is a conscious phenomena, so we situate it within a model of consciousness uh, called global workspace theory. And basically the idea is there's all of these different coalitions of thoughts competing for consciousness, and about every 150 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds, one of them wins out, and consciousness is a discrete event, and then a thought pops into mind. Mind wandering occurs when the goal irrelevant thought is the one that comes to mind. So the question is, where do these thoughts come from? So I want to talk to you about an analysis of triggers and thoughts. So uh, here we have some triggers. On the left, you can see more internal states. These are like feelings and current concerns. I'll break them up a little bit. And then you can actually go to more external things, the content of what you're actually reading, the task, and then the, the environment. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, clearly, uh, you can have on-task thoughts. These are not mind-wandering. Cool. Um, a very common type, and this is the mostly widely studied type of thought in the mind-wandering literature, are thoughts of prospection that come from current concerns. I have to do laundry today. I have to study for this quiz. It's this, it's this, it's this thing that's always, you can, you, we all have this, right? These intentions that we need to fulfill. And then you have introspection uh, that typically arise from feelings. Um, it's so, I'm kind of hungry, um, you know, the, things like that. So most of the work in mind-wandering thinks that these are the main thoughts that occur, and the reason being, it's studied in content-free environments. So most of the work in mind-wandering is done in the lab with, with lab tasks, like working memory tasks. The content is not rich. Our argument is learning is a semantically rich and interesting content that can lead to all sorts of thoughts. So let me give you an example. First, you have the learning environment itself. You can have distractors. Somebody closed the door next, uh, the door slammed. What's going on here? And you can have task-related interferences. And these are things like, oh, this is so boring. Why am I doing this? Um, and, and those types of thoughts. And by the way, these are all actual quotes of mind wandering from people. Uh, we've looked at a lot of responses. Uh, I'll show you some in a second. Um, then the, now let me see how it gets interesting. It's the content leading your mind uh, astray. So you have thoughts about the stimulus that aren't actually related. So you could be viewing a film about some historical documentary, that's your learning task, and then you'll, you'll, start, you'll start asking about, why did they choose this music, and why did they choose this scene, and who are, this, who are these actors? And the stimulus itself can trigger these thoughts. But the most, the, the most of it is occurring from memories. Memories are associative pattern completion machines. A word in the text triggers a thought, it's great if it's task related, but many times, actually, 33% of the times, based on our data, it's a semantic memory to some fact, or it's an episodic memory. Water? Oh, that reminded me about the last time I was on the beach with my cousin. Stuff like that. And you actually have fantasies. People are just fantasizing. What would happen if there's a fire drill in here right now? Uh, that's another actual example. So, um, so we've done, so we've done, a, so, so what we, so we did, we've done a lot of studies. Oh, oh and, and the last thing I'll say is sometimes the content can trigger a current concern that can lead to prospection. So the main message here is the data looks something like this. If you do stuff in semantic, semantically uh, light environments, lab tasks and things like that, you get this illusion that most of mind wandering is future oriented and it's about current concerns. When you do learning in a semantic oriented space, about half your thoughts are actually directly driven by the content. Uh, and that's what our data is showing in this paper um, under review. Um, we've actually done many studies to confirm this model. I won't get into them uh, specifically, um, but the, we get, really got the greatest insights when we just asked people, tell us what you're thinking when you're mind wandering, and then we did content coding on them. Uh, and here's, for example, an, an, an example showing um, triggers and thought trains. So the text mentions the Louvre. The Louvre, the Louvre, 
Ha ha ha, last time I was the Louvre, I threw up in front of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> I wonder how strange the people looking at this data will think I am. Maybe you should not have admitted this after all. Uh, so, so, that, so, so I've read through about a thousand of these, and I have such a good insight on the mind of the undergraduate Notre Dame student now. Uh, um, so not only is mind wandering prominent, it's actually negatively correlated with learning. This is the same meta-analysis, and this is just of our own data, um, but, but we're working on a bigger one um, of, of other people's data, uh, just a more formal meta-analysis. The problem is this correlation gets worse the more difficult the task gets. And what, what is happening here? Think about this. Learning involves, at some level, constructing a mental model. The stronger the mental model, the more you'll suppress these off-task thoughts. However, when you mind wander, your mental model is weaker. You've missed encoding. Mind wandering involves what we call perceptual decoupling. Your eyes are open, but nothing is coming in. So you've actually missed encoding a key piece of information that's needed for future inferences, leading to a weaker mental model, leading to worst suppression, and leading to more mind wandering. So it's this cascading cycle that keeps occurring. So what we want to try to do is correct it as it occurs in real time. So this leads to this question. Can we develop learning technologies that automatically sense and respond to mind wandering? Uh, and, and I like to think about these as attention-aware learning technologies. So um, one thing I should point out is um, if you think about human-to-human -human communication, it is entirely reliant on joint attention. Have you, if you, can you imagine having a conversation with somebody where you don't have a shared frame of reference? Like us right now, if I point there and you look there, and if I'm saying this and you look up, the whole thing just breaks down. This is exactly what it is like interacting with your computer. It has no idea where you're attending to. So we're trying to push for technologies that have some basic sense. It can be very simple, just knowing where you're looking, to, do, to a very complicated, understanding how, you, how you're dividing attention and how you're allocating attention, what we call attention-aware learning technologies. So I want to start with this one example that is designed to target one type of attention, and that's mind wandering. Can we detect when people mind wander and then intervene? Um, so one challenge you face is that actually mind wandering is little difficult to detect because it's an internal state. So unlike emotions that have not well defined but actually some mostly visible expressions, you don't in terms of mind wandering. So here's some examples. We had people read. This is in the lab. We had people read um, a really really boring text. It's called. It's it's the second most boring text on Google. Um, it's called. Uh, the formation of soap bubbles and the forces that mold them, and we use that to get a lot of mind wandering. Um, and, uh, and it's written 150 years ago, so the language also leads to some boredom. I personally think it's kind of cool. Uh, he designs all these cool experiments, um, so I don't know what that says about me, but, uh, uh, but it gets a lot of mind wandering um, if, you, if you're interested. So we had people read these, and then, um, and then uh, we took, when they, when they self reported mind wandering, we then looked 10 second windows right before the self reports. And we actually put them on Mechanical Turk and asked people to judge. We wanted to see how well people can judge. It took about nine, nine people to, to rate each video to get a reliable estimate. And I want to show you some examples where, where almost everybody agrees, almost everybody disagrees, and whether they get it right or wrong. So here's a case where, uh, if you look at her, almost everybody agrees that she's mind wandering. And you can look at that right there. <laughs> and here's another example. Um, look at him. So what do you think? So he's actually mind wandering, and almost everybody says no. He's not mind wandering, and people get that right. And she's not, but people always think she is because they're misreading the behavioral cues. By the way, the reason those numbers are there, if you're putting stuff online to get ratings, you want to make sure people actually watch the video. Um, so that's how we check that they actually watch the video at the end. Um, these are cases here where it's kind of ambiguous. Um, half the people agree, half the people say mind wandering, half the people say not. So they agree, they're right about half the time. Um, here's an example where, um, where people like, they're split. So see that gaze? People think that something is weird happening there. Um, but actually, in this case, um, uh, she reported mind wandering, but people said no. Uh, here's a case where he's, he's playing with his hair, but he's actually reading. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So that's a signal that's misinterpreted by about half. So the main point is that these behavioral cues can be very, very um, ambiguous. So we said, okay, let's, so let's look at uh, so, so let's look at eye gaze, and I want to give you one example um, of, of just to give you the idea of how we go about detecting mind wandering. Um, this is a case again. This is in the lab. I'll jump over to the classroom really quickly. Um, so in this case, people are watching this this movie. We, we use this movie. It's widely used in narrative film comprehension. It, it won an Oscar in like the, in 1955. It's about a boy, and he follows this balloon. It's cool. It's short. Um, some people, and, and the balloon has a life of its own. Um, some people find it annoying. Some people find it charming. Um, I find it charmingly annoying. Um, but uh, <laughs> but there's very little dialogue. It's it's something like this. And and this is one of our participants. Um, she's see so that we're tracking her eye movements. Um, and you know the balloon. This is one of the ending scenes. Um, so it's just like that. There's actually a musical score. I don't have it here. I'll show you one more example. So that, that's our reporting. And you, you notice how difficult it is even to track eye gaze uh, reliably in, in, in environments when you use uh, remote eye tracking. So we look at two types of features here. We first look at global features. These are basically like number of fixations, saccades between fixations, smooth pursuits, a bunch of, that's just explaining the dynamics of eye gaze, independent of content. That's the key word, they're independent of content. So they're more likely to generalize. And we also look at what we call local features. These are, most, these are more like things like salience. For example, in this, in this case, Everybody should be looking at the balloon, mostly. Um, and there's this phenomenon I want to call, it's called, the, when I, getting into film comprehension, this phenomenon is called the tyranny of film. We moved to film from text because I thought, text is boring, film would be cooler. Actually, it's the opposite. These people manipulate your attention, the filmmakers, so well that everybody looks at exactly the same thing. It's amazing. Uh, and, and, and you don't get enough variability in eye movements except when somebody's mind wandering. So in this case, oops, so in this case, um, we're looking at, we're looking to see to what extent are people tracking this balloon? Uh, ostensibly, that's the central aspect of this movie. You should be tracking this balloon. Um, and um, so that's one type of feature. We'll encode fixations on and off. Um, we can also look at, there's a lot of work done in low-level vision of saliency maps where people should be looking based on low-level visual cues. So this is what a saliency map looks like. And we look and seeing dynamically at the, what to what extent are people looking at the most salient region. For example, you'll notice that in the previous case, it was tracking the balloon, but now when the horses come in, it's gonna focus on the horses, because um, that's most salient at this time. So looking at this data, um, here, here are the results. So what we basically do is we compute some local features, some global features. We, we, at this point, we're doing pretty simple machine learning, very just basic static classifiers, but everything, everything I'm gonna show you is evaluated in a leave, leave one student or leave many students out. So it's supposed to generalize to new students. Um, so the validation, the, the training and separation are split at the student level. So here are some results. Uh, we also typically focus on the F1. That's the, that's the measure of the harmonic, harmonic mean between precision, how precise are your predictions, and recall, how many are you getting, of mind wandering, which is typically the minority class. So it's a pretty difficult problem. Uh, and you notice we're actually doing pretty well here. We're, we're beating kind of well. We're beating chance. Uh, and in this data set, the local features actually outperform the global features, um, which is kind of good. Um, and then com combined, they don't do much, uh, much better. So, so taking this basic model, we've actually done a lot of studies on lab-based detection of mind wandering, us using film, interaction with intelligent tutoring systems, a ton on reading, and actually most recently looking at MOOC lectures. Um, we've looked at eye gaze, facial expressions, combinations, interaction files, reading times, physiology, and everything, and in the lab, um, what you see on the right is percent improvements over task, over, over chance. We're basically pretty good at predicting, my, but we're decently okay, um, you can never be really good at this, at predicting mind wandering over chance. All in the lab. So this begs the question about what happens when we, when we take this work and apply it to an actual classroom. So this is the actual classroom we studied. Um, so the idea was, can we... In, can we embed eye trackers in a classroom when 30 people, 30 kids are actually doing learning with an intelligent tutoring system, and can we detect and respond to mind wandering, given all the noise inherent in this environment? Um, this is the biology classroom that we studied. Uh, this is eighth and ninth grade biology. Um, and uh, we studied this in the context of Guru. This is an intelligent tutor, tutoring system for, for biology. What's unique about this, Guru was built after analyzing 50 hours of conversations between expert human tutors, as we call them the Cadillac tutors, 
and students in very authentic environments, um, such as their homes, libraries. We coded, we, we coded 50,000 dialogue moves and built computational models of those that are then embedded in this tutor. Um, so we use Guru in this case, and the point is, can we sense when students zone out during Guru and then look and test some interventions? Um, we wanted to use, uh, we wanted to make sure that what we had could actually be used by students themselves. So instead of doing these $40,000 research eye trackers, we just did these consumer off-the-shelf eye tracking. So, these, so the top is the Toby Ajax that costs about $150. Bucks. The bottom is the iTribe that's about $100. Um, unfortunately, no longer available. I think Facebook acquired them. Um, so, so we wanted to use these types of trackers. Um, um, and uh, you can see in this image on the right, that's how we embedded the tracker um, on a computer using Guru. We also wanted to use the school's own equipment. So we used their computers, which were kind of low quality, so they had only dual core, so there's a lot of problems because Guru itself runs in a 3D engine, the tracker takes a lot of resources, so there's a lot of stuff here that can go wrong. Um, the last thing I want to say is we didn't want the experimenter, if anybody's done eye tracking, getting calibrations and getting the head movement, it's, it's really a pain. We didn't want the experimenter doing any of that. So we just had one experiment in the front, one in the bottom, just looking at problems. But students set up everything themselves. So there was a, there was a GUI that helped them, guided them. Here's how you position your face. Here's how you do the calibration. So this was completely student-driven data collection with us just plugging the tracker in for the most part. So the question is, in... In, a, in, a, in the wild environment of a classroom, can we get valid eye gaze data? And we collected data from 135 students. Uh, each of them did two sessions, so there's a 270 sessions total. Out of those, we got, valid, we got some eye data for 85% of the students of the sessions, and the loss of 15%, many of that had to do with just weird things that happened in the classroom. Windows 10 decided to update. And then, and then everything crashed because they put a load in the core. Um, sometimes, some, and so I would say about 5% of the students was really eye tracking problems. They wouldn't calibrate or something. So here's, a, here's some examples. So here's some, here's some data. So on the top, use the top histogram. These are, these are session level validity scores. The eye tracker gives validity. That just means, did it get a sample? The top one is one eye was tracked. In many cases, that's more than enough. And it's actually pretty good um, in terms of validity. The bottom is both eyes were tracked, and that's actually still pretty decent. We don't even need to track both eyes to do a lot of computation on it. But um, I want to just point out that we were surprised we can actually collect uh, pretty good data in an actual classroom environment using eye tracking that students set up themselves. Um, here's some examples of uh, fixation plots. In the top is the main display. You can notice the eye tracking. The people are ma mainly attracted to the tip of the nose, and then some at the multimodal display. In the bottom is a different activity of Guru. This is concept mapping, and you can see uh, gaze in sort of places we'd expect them to be. So the question is, the eye tracking looks decent. Is it good enough to build a model of mind wandering? So um, here are some results. So here's what we did in this case. We have two types of features. We first have the typical global features. These are your basic fixations. I, I, I think I already said what those are. And we looked at a second type of feature, what we call locality features. It's a pretty naive encoding of eye gaze. So you basically look and see, you, you divide the screen into these different boxes, and you kind of just look at what's the proportion of eye gaze in, different, in each box. Um, and here are some results. So we have chance. Global features, locality features. We had some context features. We are still doing a deeper analysis of context. These are things like, what, how far in the session are you? How, how well are you being respond? How, how well are you responding? What's the feedback you're getting? Just encoding what's happening right now. What part of Guru are you in? And there's a combination. And we noticed that uh, we, and this is again, leave one student out validation. Uh, we do pretty good in beating chance models, and our global and local features or locality features are actually tied in this data set. Context is not doing bad, given how simple the models are. And again, um, this is a very common phenomenon. I'll get into this later, but combining things very rarely gives you actually big boost. Um, so um, we did one last thing. Oh, and then, and then we also want a detector to correlate with learning. So what you see here is they, they take a post-test at the end. The red bar is the correlation between self-reported mind wandering, two probes, and learning gains, and that's about negative 0.2, which is in line with that meta-analysis I mentioned. However, the gaze model, especially with locality features, predicts learning as well as the self-reports, um, which, which kind of gives some evidence of pred predictive validity of this detector. Um, we did one other thing. We had previously collected data in the lab before we went to the schools. So we said, okay, can we, how do the models from the lab generalize to the schools? I wanna point out there's many more differences than just lab school, there were different eye trackers, the lab used the IX, um, uh, there were different student populations, there was a lot of differences, but the basic task was interacting with Guru. Um, so here's what I'm gonna show you. Um, the left is models trained in the lab, and the right is models trained in the school, and, the, uh, and these, the, the green bars are tested in the lab and tested in the school. 
And we noticed that models trained in the lab actually generalize pretty well to models trained in the school. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool, given how different the context is. Um, and the other interesting point here is actually models trained, but it's, they're never as good as models actually trained in the school, which typically don't generalize so well to models trained in the lab. So, so there's something happening in the school environment that the models are picking up that is just not there in the more controlled lab environment. Um, so but, but it, so there's some interesting data here. So lastly, I just want to point out, we also did work on, uh, in addition to looking at gaze, we also did work on facial feature tracking. Um, and we're using, um, um, and I want to just uh, give you give a plug for this great tool. It's called OpenFace. It's from CMU. Um, I've been doing facial feature tracking for about, for about almost 15 years. And it's really frustrating because every time you get a package you like, some company buys them out. And you have to start over every single time. But this is free, and it's open. Uh, so I hope they don't get bought out. Um, and it's pretty good. So um, you can see how it's, it's doing a pretty good job here. This is an easy case. See, look how it's trying to interpolate the mouth movements. This is the more difficult case, but it's pretty, pretty decent still. And, uh, and with him, you know, it's not perfect. Um, I thought, thought the number was a face. Um, so, um, so, so what we did here was, um, in previous research, we, we look at the face in, in, uh, in, many, in many dimensions. We, so we do, many, we, do, we do different types of encoding. In this data, we did this in the school. We, didn't, we did not record video. We basically took the images, stripped up, run them through the model, got our features, and discarded the video because, because there's a lot of sensitivity to recording video. And actually, people were, people were cool with that. Um, and of course, we got consent. But uh, that limited what we could actually do. So, so we couldn't do deep textual mappings and things like that that we would typically do in, in computer vision. So we're doing very simple models here. I want to show you some results. Um, so the chance, and this is the gaze model that I showed you previously. You have facial activation. This is just how different features are activated. We have about 15 or 20. We have co-activation, how they activate together. Um, and again, another thing to note in facial data is you have a lot of missing data, so you cannot do good temporal modeling. So you've got to, deal, you've got to do co-activation co at the level of distributions. And then we combine the, the activation and co-activation. One finding not mentioned here from previous work in the lab is our computer models from the face actually outperform humans in the task of mind-wandering detection, which is something that's super exciting to me. Um, so humans can detect at about 59%, and the computer models can detect accurately at about 63%. And I know it's a small number, but it's significant, um, and, and, and then we can beat humans. Um, so this is it uh, in, the, in a task of mind-wandering detection. So here are the results. Um, so the gaze is better than the face, um, but you still note that the face um, is, is better than chance. And now the question that we're working on now is how do the, what happens when you combine these two? So um, the last thing I wanted to say on this is, uh, where are we going with this? So um, if you think about a typical intelligent tutoring system, like Guru, there's a student. So the, the green stuff is what it typically does. Student does the action. There's some assessment of the action. And then there's, uh, and there's a student model, and there's action selection. What we're arguing here is a layer of computing on top of this that we call the attentional aware computing layer that, in this case, it does not need to be an eye tracker, but it's an eye tracker first. Uh, we've done work on that. Then this mind-wandering detector, we're still doing work on that. And the most exciting thing now is, what do we do? How do we intervene? And we're working on different ways to look at interventions when mind-wandering is detected. Um, once that's done, uh, we're doing a lot of design research in the schools right now. We'll actually then do a summative evaluation. So, so, so good results to follow. So um, I'm just going to turn over completely now, uh, very quickly, to this idea of looking at teacher learning. So we focus on the student. I think there's great opportunity here, even more than looking at student behaviors in the classroom, to looking at teacher learning. Um, so um, one thing to note is that this is a report published by this nonprofit called the New Teacher Project. It's looking at what are the outcomes on teacher professional development. And this looked at, they looked at two large public school districts in the United States. They don't name them. Probably something, if I had to guess, New York, Chicago, LA, so large, and one big public charter, big, um, charter school district. And here are their findings that I have to say are kind of sobering. Um, and they call the report the Mirage, confronting the hard truth about our quest for teacher development. Here are some of the findings. Um, the districts are spending an average of $18,000 a year per teacher on teacher development. So they're spending a lot of time, and it's about 21 days of teacher professional development. However, only three out of every 10 teachers shows any signs of improvement five stay the same, and two actually decline in performance. If you get any gains, they occur during the first five years of the profession, and then teachers basically plateau. 
And it's not like they plateau because they're, they're great. They, there's still a lot of room for improvement. So they're, they're not at this level of expertise. So what's actually happening here? And if you think about this, how is, how is professional development typically happening? There's a seminar on Saturday, somebody gives a talk, and that's it. And if you confront that with how experts practice, how does Katie Ledecky practice? How does an expert musician practice? They practice, they get feedback. They practice, they get feedback. They practice, they get feedback. They get a coach, and then they'll deliver one great performance. What's happening with teaching? Performance, 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 performance. Occasionally, a principal will come, evaluate the lesson. It's evaluative feedback, and then performance, performance, performance. How can somebody learn and improve if they have no feedback on what they're doing? That's the problem. Um, and one of the key recommendations here was give teachers a clear, deep understanding of their own performance and progress. And I think all of us in the learning, co learning community know that without feedback, there is no learning. So uh, what we set out to do was, can learning analytics help us? Can we figure out a way to give teachers feedback? And let me be very clear, formative feedback, not evaluative feedback, formative feedback on what they do in the classroom. Um, so this is a project um, with colleagues um, at Wisconsin, um, Memphis, um, and Pittsburgh, uh, and us at Notre Dame. It's called Automating the Measurement and Assessment of Classroom Discourse. And we, uh, and we said, um, hey, could we figure out what teachers are doing in classrooms in a fully automatic way and in a cost-effective way? Let's give it a shot. Um, we are, we are inspired by a particular theoretical model of, disc, of, of classroom discourse. Uh, this is from middle school English and language arts class called Dialogic Instruction. And the idea here is it's about using dialogue, open-ended discussion as a central theme to, to drive student engagement and achievement. And it's based on two core books. One is called Opening Dialogue, and the other one is Inspiring Dialogue. But it shares commonalities with a lot of frameworks, accountable talk, talking to learn, and so on and so forth. Um, the data that supports the study came from these large-scale studies, and, and the scope of this is still amazing to me today, in the 90s and early 2000s, as, as reported in this book. They went to hundreds, hundreds of middle school classrooms over, over like almost a decade, and they actually encoded every single question asked in those classrooms. Um, and they've studied about thousands of, hundreds of teachers and about thousands of students. Then they went to see, what predicts student achievement after controlling for a lot of sociodemographics, procedural engagement, they show up to class, they do their homework, and what are the features of what the teacher does predicts student achievement? And they find in these classrooms, it's this. Discussion, open-ended discussion is one of the best predictors of student achievement. And it's amazing, it's kind of scandalous that there's on average, 45 seconds of discussion in a classroom, in an English language classroom, yet it's the best predictor of learning. The other two focused on types of questions. One is what we call authentic questions. These are questions that don't have prescripted responses. So the question is, what do you think about this? There is no answer. What is authentic depends on the context. The same question in one context is authentic, but if it doesn't get a response because it didn't match the students, it would be non-authentic. So, the, you, so you're, we're coding information here at the level of the question event, not the actual question. And the third is uptake. Do the teachers build on what the students actually say? So if you have discussion, if you have questions that are authentic and uptake, and this occurs, what happens then you get into these, you get a snowball effect of this dialogic spell where the whole class is engaging in open-ended discussion, and that's where the learning is actually occurring. That's, that's what this, theor this theoretical model and the data kind of shows. So we focused on detecting Discussion, Q&A, authentic questions, fully auto, in a fully automatic fashion. So I want to tell you a little bit about how we went about this task. We wanted to make sure we could do something that teachers could actually use, so at, and, and we could do this at scale. So at first, video was totally out, and the reason being there's all these privacy concerns. So we said, no video. Let's do this entirely with audio. Um, now, if you just take, a, if you take a, 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 a microphone like this on a laptop and you set it right here and you record audio in a classroom, you'll get something like this. All right, what are some big risks that you have taken you don't want to share? So it's good, humans can, you can, humans can hear what's happening, but automatic speech recognition will fail completely on stuff like this, it's just not good enough quality. So after doing a lot of design work, and I'm talking like going to the schools and, and, and crawling down and putting microphones here and there and everything like this, we came up with this solution. Um, so the teachers wear this wireless mic, it's an awesome microphone, it costs about $300, uh, and it just gives you very good quality teacher speech. 
To record the classroom, we could not also mic individual students. Um, there's privacy concerns. It's just not, it's not practical. Um, what we did was we used this classroom mic. This is called a pressure zone um, a PCM a microphone. It's basically a boundary mic. It's used to record like choirs and theaters. And you essentially just, just put it on a board and put it in the back uh, of the, of the, of the, of the whiteboard, and then the whole surface becomes a reflecting surface. So they're really cool. They also cost about $250 to $300. Um, and then um, for anybody who's done audio synchronization, never ever try to synchronize audio and software. It just never works uh, because sound is really slow. So if the teachers move around, it takes longer for the sound source to hit the, micro to hit the microphones. It, it's, it's a mess. So we just have this very cheap mixer that mixes the two um, and synchronizes them um, in hardware. And then you get something like this, a really high quality, teacher signal, because that's a noise canceling microphone, and an okay quality general recording of the whole classroom. So let me give you some examples. Um, this is first the teacher mic. The time and place in which a story takes place. I mean, that's amazing for a live, noisy, actual classroom environment. Um, it's not always perfect. So here's this, here's this, some, you'll see some background noise in this one. There, got it. Playing a film. Braxton, you're working, not talking. Um, and this is what we get from the actual classroom mic, the one in the bottom. <laughs> um, um, yeah, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> hey, what's the word? The utopia. <laughs> the utopia could lead to a dystopia because something could go wrong. Okay. Like something they made could go horribly wrong and create a dystopia such as a dream turning into a nightmare. So that's, that's an example. It's, it's good enough to detect that students spoke, which is really important to see questions, but it's probably not good enough at this point to do speech recognition, although we're still working on it. Um, so here's what we did. So we collected data, uh, so over two and a half years, from about 14 teachers in seven schools um, in, the, in the Midwest. Um, there's a ton of data. It's 128 hours of recording um, of about 132 classes. Um, so we basically had set up the microphones, and they just record. And they just record. And while that's happening, there's a coder using the software to actually code what's transpiring in the classroom. And it's doing it at three levels. The episode level, we're talking about um, the Civil War today. The segment level, how the episode is implemented. I'll start with a lecture. I may show you a video of the Civil War. Then we'll get into Q&A. We call that the segment. And then, because of our focus on dialogism, the question level. So these are individual questions. So every time a question's occurring, the coders make a quick live code, and then they go back and play back the tapes and actually uh, refine the coding and do agreement and everything. And for questions, we code many things, such as question properties. Is it authentic? Was it a response? Was it feedback? Was it this? Was it that? And our task is, can we replicate these human codes at the segment level and the question level entirely from these audio streams? So very quickly, um, there's a lot happening here uh, in how we model this. Um, I'll just basically uh, say that we're modeling the audio, because all we have is audio. We have to model it in every possible way. So we do look at the temporal uh, relationships. We look at this in the spectral domain and the temporal domain. There's acoustic stuff. There's some language features. Um, there's simple machine learning. But there's also, um, we've, we've done some work with looking at more deep recurrent neural networks, because um, a lot of this is very contextual and temporal driven. So there's a lot of modeling here. Um, and I'll refer you to papers for details. I just want to give you a high level overview of our findings. Um, so one first task is, you have this whole audio stream. You've got to break it into utterances. Um, it's actually of pretty good quality, because it's teacher audio. So a very simple approach works. Detect the amplitude envelope. And when there's silence of a certain threshold, you break up the utterances. Then you run all your candidate utterances through a speech recognizer as an additional filter. That approach actually gets us pretty good. We can detect about uh, F1 score for teacher utterance segmentation is about 97%. So it's like amazing. Students, a little more challenging because there are many students. So what, what we do very quickly is we just run this through a, a, a diarizer that basically says, given an audio stream, who are the different sources of audio? And it, it has thousands of files, and then they're clustered in some way. And then we use the teacher audio to actually separate the teacher speech. So this is imperfect, um, but, we, but it's better than chance. And we're actually trying to improve this all the time. It's much better than chance. What I'm amazed is this is the results on speech recognition. So here we have, um, these are web-based speech recognition engines. You have the Google SAPI speech recognition engine from 2017. This is um, 2015. And there's Bing, that's Microsoft's, and AT&T. And I have two metrics here. The blue is word accuracy. This is basically an edit, essentially an edit distance. It's basically, you can think about the accuracy of speech recognition when you control for 
the order, the actual syntax. And the other one is just word overlap. How many words are we overlapping? And I am still amazed by this finding. Um, so currently, in a noisy classroom with the Google 2017 speech recognizer, we can get almost 80% of the words of natural conversational speech with multi-party chatter and overlap and everything. I was doing this work 10 years ago in the lab in controlled environments, and I was getting half as much results. So it's, a, it's just a true testament to how the speech recognition field and community has grown. Here's the same thing with Google two years ago, and you can see a marked improvement. Um, and this is all the data from uh, Bing and AT&T. So, 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 the, so uh, it's, it's kind of amazing how, 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 what the technology is like. Um, so that's really cool. So let me talk a little bit about work on instructional segment classification. Here we're looking to detect the following. Question and answers, procedures and directions, seat work, group work, and lecture. These five, and this, and, uh, these five uh, account for about 76% of what happens. Discussion is grouped under Q&A. Um, we have a chance model. We have a model based on the teacher mic, just looking at the teacher audio, and another model based on the classroom mic also. Um, and here's what we find. Um, basically, we do pretty decent. This is with the teacher mic. Um, um, with the classroom mic, that's the green, you don't get much of a benefit uh, for Q&A and procedures and directions, but you do get it for lecture, for group work, and for seat work. So if the question is, do I need this extra hassle of a second microphone for this task? Uh, kind of, depending on what you're focusing on. If you're just focusing on Q&A, probably not. And again, these are all leave one teacher out validation. So the data is trained on all but one teachers and tested on the last teacher. And then we beat, we really do much better than chance, um, which is cool. So very quickly, I want to just uh, tell you two other results. Uh, okay, good. So now let's look into these Q&As. Can we detect questions? Um, so here are some results on question detection. So uh, this was actually presented yesterday. Um, uh, so we have natural language features. Here we're looking at very, very high level encodings. What do the terms, what occurs, noun terms. We don't actually use content or what, we don't use any bag of words approach of actual content. The reason being, we want this to generalize across topics. Today I'm talking about the Civil War. Tomorrow I'll talk about something else that's totally different. So I'm actually dealing with low level content features the models will never generalize. So these are all high level abstract kinds of terms. Um, acoustic features and context. Um, a lot of people think that detecting questions just means detecting pitch and intonation. Actually, it's not the case. Um, um, and by, by combining them, you get a small boost. So let me give you some examples about how weird questions are in this context. So a lot of the questions are just single, simple names of teachers calling on students, like this. Patrick? That's, and that's it. Um, other times, you actually have, other times you actually have the same thing, but in a different context. So look at this one. James? So she, this is more like giving discipline and things like that. So we're trying to encode things like these. So, uh, so the results are pretty decent. Um, I want to just very quickly note that um, what we do here is we actually combine the speech recognizers. We don't do it at the word level, but we do it at the feature level, and you get a good boost by combining the speech recognizers. Um, and the last thing I want to say is um, all of this is inherently imperfect, and that's okay. All we need is a probabilistic approach that just gives probabilities for events as they're occurring. However, if you aggregate the probabilities, as you can think about them as being weak evidence, you actually can get really good results. So what we have here is, for each class session, what's the predicted proportion of questions from our models? So we're just aggregating the individual predictions, which is the actual proportion as coded by humans. And this correlates at like 0.8, 0.85 actually. So, so, so it's, it's difficult to get the individual things right all the time, but when you average them out, you can be pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, the last piece of data I want to show you is on question property classification. This is like fresh out of the press. Uh, well, it's hopefully it will be fresh out of the press if accepted. Um, and this is on detecting authentic questions. I want to tell you again, authentic, authentic questions are on without prescripted responses, uh, and they're based entirely on, um, and, 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 and the question is, can you detect them from the question words alone? So uh, we first did this model on a data set of 25,000 questions. These are human-coded questions from those studies I told you about in the 90s. Um, and our models can do about 0.42. So here we're looking at some language features. We're also looking at, there's a discourse parser that actually looks at all the, the whole class session and looks at uh, anaphora and different relationships. Uh, and that's pretty decent. This is the result um, on our current data. Uh, this is with speech recognition, um, and it's, it's also pretty decent. So these are what I call direct session level models. We're literally predicting the proportion of authenticity across the entire session rather than looking at each individual utterance. 
We're going to use this data to then feed back into individual models. A big challenge of machine learning occurs when there's uneven baselines. If you notice, there's a bunch there on the left that there's zero authentic questions. That really throws off the machine learning. So the idea is, let's get a session-level prediction, use that input to then do individual utterance classification. That's what we're working on. So very quickly, uh, next steps uh, with this. What we're doing here is, in the last year, we actually gave students a learning assessment. So we now have achievement data. We've reconfirmed our findings that after controlling for socio-demographics and after controlling for um, behavioral engagement, authenticity, discussion, uptake, predict achievement. So that replicated the data from like 15 years ago. But that was based on human coding. We're trying to see now if we can get the exact same thing using our computer codes. So can we, repl or can we even get better results using computer coding than based on human coding? And that's ongoing like at this moment. And what we want to go in the future is, as I just said, closing the loop back again, thinking about instruction without feedback. What, I wanted, what we want to, want to do is give teachers low pressure, low stakes, formative feedback as, as a sort of do-it-yourself professional development. So, so our dream is they can take this microphone, we're going to work with even cheaper systems, um, basically upload their audio, get it all processed, and get some kind of report of feedback of what they actually did. They can actually look at that themselves and reflect on it. So reflective practice is one of, the most, one of the most effective forms of professional development. They can do it themselves, or they can do it with a coach. The most important thing here is it's based on data, the, those graphs there. It's not based on some reconstruction of what happened in the classroom. It's not based on somebody ob observing. It's based on actual objective data. And I, I, we feel that that could be a transformative impact, hopefully, on the profession. Um, so um, let me just end with a couple of quick notes um, on this idea of what we think about multimodal learning analytics. Um, just to, I, I, and I don't want to do some extended discussion, but just the two things. So first of all, uh, I think we all agree here that the analytics part is important uh, since we're at LAC. So the question is, to what extent is the multimodal part important, and to what extent is the classroom part important? So a question is, you may ask is, do you need to do this in a classroom? And, um, and I have mixed thoughts about this. So uh, we do a lot of work in the lab, too. Um, we do a lot of work online. And more recently, we've been doing a lot of work in the classroom. And um, I would just say it, it, it really just depends. You can get, a, you can get away with a lot um, in the lab in initial work. But one decision we made on this teacher project, uh, our, our gut instinct said, let's first of all, this is what we do. Let's take a lab. Let's instrument it like a classroom. Let's put like these million microphones. Let's study everything. And then, let, then let's hope it generalizes to the classroom. And that just never, ever works. I, I, I just, it just doesn't. Uh, you just have to start, you literally have to start over when you go into the wild. So we abandoned that and said, let's just go into the classroom, let's just fail spectacularly, and we did. So we actually had people drive five hours for each collection of data points because, it's, because we didn't have permission from the local schools, and we lost an entire semester of data for silly things like, for example, Instead of recording from the teacher mic, it was recording from the default microphone of the laptop. We lost a semester of data because of that. So, so um, different configurations of classrooms. But through those experiences, we really learned some things that we could have never learned in the lab. For example, this is a typical classroom. If I had to set something up in the lab, I would do it like this. But we noticed a lot of classrooms are set up like this. This is middle school. There are a lot of great teachers out there who believe in discussion and want to create this atmosphere. I don't know where to put the PZM mic in this context. You know, where do you put it in the, in the oops. <laughs> oh, uh, so, so, so I just want to say it's OK to do some initial things in the lab, no problem. Um, but at, at some point, you just have to get there and just take a beating because the real world will keep you honest. Um, the other thing is, does it need to be multimodal? One thing, um, people who get into multi, I talk about a lot of my students, when they get into multimodal, there's this, there's this illusion that multimodal always gives you a bump in performance. It rarely does. Human communication is redundant. What multimodal does is it takes advantage of the redundancy. So for example, um, let me give you an example of a study. This is done with um, Ryan Baker and Val Schutz group uh, and us. This was, uh, I didn't talk about this today, but this was our work at doing affect detection in classrooms. Um, and you know, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty noisy environment. I'll just play you a quick video. This is a game called Physics Playground. So you can see how noisy the environment is, and we're actually recording facial expressions and doing um, coding uh, to build affect detectors, um, and so on and so forth. And here are some results. Um, so we have here 
Um, how accurate the models are, this is AUC. Um, we see that the face models in blue in this context outperform the interaction-based models. This is looking at log files and things like that. Um, but however, the face is only available 65% of the time. For a third of the time, you can get the face. They're chewing gum, they're talking, they're this, sometimes just leaving. They're talking on their cell phones. It's actually the wild. Um, and um, uh, the interaction model is actually available. You have data all the time, 98% of the time. By combining them, we have a detector now that works almost all the time, that's the multimodal detector, and it's not as accurate as a face model, but it's almost close. So in terms of multimodality, um, accuracy is one thing, and if, if you get a boost in accuracy, for example, in affect detection, you're almost guaranteed to get about a 4% boost in accuracy on average looking at multimodal, if it's naturalistic data, but there's much more than just uh, looking at accuracy. Um, some last thoughts, uh, uh, just from my own experiences. It is really important to set design constraints now rather than think of these as afterthoughts. Um, so uh, many times, so in this project, with, to give you an example, in the teacher project, we said, we want this thing to be cost effective. We want a school to actually be able to buy it. Um, so we said everything should be under $750. Yes, that's still expensive, but a school can buy that equipment and then they can reuse it. Um, and that really constrained the types of things we could do. Um, we wanted it to be flexible, so we want to study it in different classroom environments, and that was kind of important. Um, um, the most important thing that I learned in this experience is it needs to be usable by non-technical people, and that's really key. So, we, so a teacher has two minutes to set this up, and then they got to go. How do you do adjust audio levels? These are smart people, who are, but they're just not computer scientist people. So, so, so a lot of things that we think about, oh, you should have disabled the audio volume on your default audio. No, that should have been in the data recording package. And the last thing I'll say, so think about usability for non-technical smart people, but non-technical people. And last, um, this is a contentious issue. Our feeling is um, if it's approached with respect and mutual give and take, uh, this has become uh, pretty workable. So let me give you two examples. In the case with this collecting data in the classrooms, the mind wandering stuff, we had to get the parental consent. Um, the principal said, you cannot record video, fine. So we had to compromise, okay, we'll strip off the video. What we felt, into, for those who are interested in collecting multimodal data, if you show people what the signals look like, we actually, in our consent, included direct examples of the output, and the parents could actually see what we're recording, uh, and that alleviated a lot of concerns. Uh, the reason we did audio is audio, for the teaching stuff, audio constitutes recording of natural classroom observation. So if you're not doing student, if you're not doing anything with the students, no, no assessments, you can, you can actually just, you're exempt from a lot of things because you're just recording a natural environment. Video would have ruined all of that because we'd have to get consent from individual students. Um, so so the, the main thing I want to say is just, we just think about setting these constraints up front rather than worrying about them later. And I've learned this through bitter experience uh, many times. Uh, and lastly, um, it's important to generalize beyond the individual. All our models now generalize across teachers and students, which is cool. But when you're doing things with eye tracking, does your model generalize to people who don't wear glasses? That's a big deal. Um, uh, different demographics. Uh, in school environments, time is the key, key factor here, because what happens is the, the school system is a complete dynamical system with chaotic dynamics. What happens in one semester completely is different can happen in the next semester. So being able to do models that generalize across time is actually really critical. They adopt this new standard. All your old models are now redundant. And other, other quick things. Um, that, that, uh, so this is, these are all the things that are on our list. We haven't done much work in this area, but we're looking at looking much deeper at generalizability. So um, I, hope I've, uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, we can learn a lot of cool things uh, about students and teachers by observing what they do in real world classrooms. Um, uh, and it's really great fun. It's, it's, it's been a very professionally rewarding uh, and humbling experience for me. Um, and also uh, what we haven't done enough of what we're getting into this is how we leverage these insights to make teaching and learning, what can we do? How do we close the loop? And we're gonna start uh, doing more work uh, in this direction. There's uh, tremendous um, opportunities um, along the way. Um, and uh, I, hope I've, uh, I hope I've convinced you at least that the classroom is an exciting and fun place to study both teaching as well as learning, because um, it's, it's really just a wild, amazing place. Uh, and I want to leave you uh, with a fun video. Um, if, if you're like me, um, I, was, I was a bit of a prankster in, in school. Um, some kids doing some, just being kids. Um, <laughs> but look, but look, look at this. <laughs> and they all have me a good laugh. Um, so, um, so thanks again uh, for your attention um, and for inviting me uh, to laugh.